Hey again, branch line. <laughs> Did I ever tell you guys that you're a good looking bunch? Like, I just get up here on Sunday and I'm like, oh, you guys look so good this morning. Last week, we started our homecoming series by looking at two stories that Jesus told us. The story of the lost sheep and the story of the lost coin. That God would leave the 99 sheep to find that one lost sheep. That God celebrates whenever one lost thing is found. And these two stories give us a glimpse into God's heart, right? That God is most interested in that which is lost. And as representatives of God, we should share in that interest. That we should be a community that is full of people who want to invite and call home all those who are lost. This week we're continuing our homecoming series by looking at the third story that Jesus tells. The story of the lost son. If you've been a part of church circles, you might have known it as the parable of the prodigal son. So let's jump in because this story is so good and we got so much to say today. So Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32 says this, to illustrate the, illustrate the point further, right, the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin, to illustrate those further, Jesus tells them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with the feast. For the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to Jesus' story this morning. Lord, that as our Father, you welcome us home, and you welcome home all of your children who are lost. Lord, we pray that we would further understand your love, your grace, your mercy, your compassion for humanity, so that it might change how we live in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This story is so rich, right? Um, when I was reading it, I came up with about 12 different sermons I could preach. I'm not going to put you all through that. We're just doing three. But it kind of gives us an understanding of God and of ourselves that will change our lives if we actually come to understand them completely. One of my favorite authors, a Dutch Catholic priest named Henry Nouwen, wrote a book called The Return of the Prodigal Son, A Story of Homecoming. It's actually where we get the namesake for the series, and a lot of wisdom from this series is in this book. And in this book, Henry writes about this specific story Jesus told, and he relates it to a painting that Rembrandt did, the painting on the cover of his book. We're going to spend three weeks looking at the story of the prodigal son, and I thought, maybe I should just read you guys this book, because he says all the good stuff, right? But you know, there's like copyrights, and you guys actually like, you know, want me to preach, I think. So... We're going to pull pieces of what Jesus says and what Henry writes about to more fully understand the complexity of this passage and what it means for how we follow Jesus. Today, we're going to focus on the father and his reaction to his sons. Next week, we're going to take a look at the lost son and his journey back home. And the final week of the series will focus on the older brother. Jesus tells the story of a family with a young son who takes his inheritance, moves away, and ruins his life. And when he comes home, his father and older brother tell him, serves you right. No, no. The younger son comes home, expecting to simply find employment, but instead finds redemption, compassion, love, at least from the father. He finds home again, his role as son again. Now, Jesus told this story with a very specific audience. It was clear that Jesus wanted to communicate that the father is God, or the Godfather, depending on if you like that terminology. And he wanted to show God's heart to all who are lost, who may one day come home, and God's compassion for those people. And it was clear that the lost son was all the sinful people out there. The ones who didn't obey the commands of God. The ones who walked away from God. The ones who didn't uphold the law of Moses in ancient Israel. And perhaps most blunt is that the older brother was the Pharisees and teachers of religious law in Israel. Those that grumbled and complained and were angry when God's compassion was shown to those who God deemed to give it to. And not those who the religious elite felt it should be given to. It was this scandalous story to tell a crowd who all their life had been told that the religious leaders were closest to God, were the most blessed, would be given the most compassion by God, and that all the sinners would actually just get their comeuppance. Instead, Jesus tells the story that it's all God's children who choose Jesus that receive that compassion. And so we are given the invitation with this story being told to place ourselves into it. Will we, like the lost son, choose to return home and receive God's love? How will we respond when God's compassion falls on those that we don't think it should? Will we ever fully understand the Father's heart? If you follow Jesus, you'll come back to this story again and again. So let's get to the Father this morning. And the first thing that we need to know is, despite being mistreated, the Father's heart breaks for his lost children. The Father's heart breaks for his lost children. We have to understand this very important thing this morning. When Jesus tells you something, it's the truth. Jesus is the exact representation of who God is, and he describes God truthfully. And in this story, we get a representation of who God is in the Father. You're going to notice at the beginning of the passage this part. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. His younger son wanted the inheritance, and the father agreed. It's scandalous to ask for your inheritance before your father dies. Making his father sell half of his possessions, making his father sell half the land to give to an ungrateful son who skips town. 
Can you guys imagine the amount of pain that this would cause? Perhaps the anger that it should invoke, especially in a land where sons were expected to live with their fathers and take care of them in their own age. Not the best choice, younger son. And the interesting thing here is the word wealth. In the original language of Greek, it's the word bios. And sometimes bios is used to describe all the wealth the person has or all the possessions they have. But it's actually used also to just describe life and being alive. It's where we get our word biology or the study of life. There are other words for riches, for money, but Jesus chose bios because it tells us something important about God, that when a child leaves, it affects God deeply. This is not just about money. This is about God's life being divided. Within this story, there are two kinds of sons, those who are at home with the father and those that are not. And when God's children walk away, part of life itself is lost for God. And that tells us so, something so important about God, right? Because we can sometimes think God is angry. We can sometimes think God is distant, like he's some great Zeus character waiting to strike us down when we mess up. Or God is some intergalactic being who doesn't really care just about one person, especially a person like myself. But in this story, the heart of God is revealed. While humanity is separated from God, God's life is divided. God's heart stays home with all those who are home with God, but God's heart is always longing for the sons and daughters who left and haven't come home yet. And church, if even one child was still out there, God's life would still be divided. You see this in the story. The father sees his younger son while he was still a long way off. And it gives you the impression that the father constantly had one eye on the horizon, right? Just waiting for something that looked like his child coming home. It reminded me of when Noah had surgery as a kid. He had some, like, ducks that needed to be cleaned out. We waited in the waiting room, and every single time those doors opened for one of the doctors to come out, we were like, is that... Nope, not our doctor, right? And you sit there and you wait and you're constantly keeping your eye over here while trying to distract yourself over here. For days, months, years, while the father worked, while the father rested, while the father ate, always he looked out to the horizon for his child to come home. Imagine all the false starts he did, right? Where he runs down some stranger on the road only to find that it wasn't his son. And yet he still remains ready to sprint after the son when he first spotted him. He runs to the younger son. He doesn't walk. He doesn't sit and wait for the son to approach and give his apologies. The father runs to his children. God runs to us when we choose to return home. Henry Nouwen put it like this. God rejoices when one repentant sinner returns. Statistically, that is not very interesting, but for God, numbers never seem to matter. From God's perspective, one hidden act of repentance, one little gesture of selfless love, one moment of true forgiveness is all that is needed to bring God from his throne to run to his returning son and to fill the heavens with sounds of divine joy. That's God calling <laughs> Better answer. <laughs> All it takes is one person to make God this joyful, people. One person. In this story, we begin to understand God's heart towards humanity. Ever since humanity walked away from God, life is not as it should be for God. And God is always oriented towards his children coming home. It's the only way that life can be restored to its fullness. This is why Jesus came to this world, to restore us to God. John 3, 16 and 17 says this. You might be familiar with the first part. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so whoever believes in him won't perish, 
but will have eternal life. Verse 17, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. We tend to hear this passage as something that we receive, right? Eternal life, great, all about it, God. But the motivation behind it is this massive amount of God's love. God so loved, God searches for the lost, God longs to see the child come home, that the father is not out there to judge and condemn, but he restores and saves. The same love the father in this story and in John 3.16 has for his lost child is the same love that God has for you and just you, no matter what you've done in the distant land. He's not interested in condemning you. He's only interested in you coming home. God is waiting for his children to choose to come home. He's waiting and looking to the horizon, ready and willing to run and embrace and love his children who choose to come home. And he waits and watches no matter what you're done or are going to do or have done in the distant land. God's love isn't just for those children also that are in some distant land. Remember the elder son. The father's son love is shown for the elder son too, the one who has been home the whole time. When the elder son refused to go in, did the father come out and yell at him for being angry that his younger son was home? No. Instead, we see the same compassion and love that was expressed towards the younger son, a yearning for the elder son to understand that everything the father has he loves the elder son with. In many ways, both sons were lost and in need of the father's love. Henry puts it this way. The parable that Rembrandt painted might well be called the parable of the lost sons. Not only did the younger son, who left home to look for freedom and happiness in a distant country, get lost, but the one who stayed home also became a lost man. Exteriorly, he did all the things a good son is supposed to do. But interiorly, he wandered away from his father. He did his duty. He worked hard every day. He fulfilled all his obligations, but became increasingly unhappy and unfree. If you've been a Christian for a long time, that one might hit home for you, right? You know there are times where even though you're home, you still lost your way. You lose the hope. You lose the understanding of God's love the father seeks to love any of his lost children. In any way, they are lost. No matter if you're like the younger son or the older son, God loves you with everything he's got. I want to apply this love of God in two ways today. First, how you view the father will be how you view others. How you view the father will be how you view others. The difference between the Pharisees and Jesus is pretty stark in the Gospels. And the main difference seems to be in how they see God. Jesus knows God intimately as his Father. Jesus sees God as the one who runs toward the lost, who would give and sacrifice the most important thing in order to have these children home. But the Pharisees saw God as a rule-keeping God. They needed to follow the rules and regulations, and if they followed it correctly, then God would bless them. Inherent in their view of God was that God was over there and we needed to do the right things to get to God through our good behaviors. And how they viewed God influenced how they viewed other people. When the Pharisees encountered sinners and people who didn't behave, they separated themselves from them, judged them, condemned them. They reminded the people of the hurdles that they needed to jump through in order to get to God. Remember last week when we saw their complaining at the beginning of Luke 15? Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. In the Pharisees' minds, because God was interested in the rules of purity, they treated others based on their purity. They knew and followed the law, but they had lost the heart of God. Jesus knows the heart of God. 
He goes into places with the sinners. He doesn't confront them with condemnation or judgment. He confronts them with the love of the Father, the one who wants to call them home, to free them from every sin they've hung on their necks like an anvil that would keep them away from God. Not to name them as sinner, but to name them as children of God. Jesus isn't putting hurdles in people's paths to get them back to God. He's tearing them down. He's chasing people down and bludgeoning them with not rules and regulations, but he's bludgeoning them with God's mercy and grace. I know not the greatest imagery, but just roll with it, okay? How you view the Father will be how you view yourself and how you view others. Henry puts it this way. What I do know with unwavering certainty is the heart of the Father. It is a heart of limitless mercy. Here is the God I want to believe in. A Father who, from the beginning of creation, has stretched out his arms in merciful blessing, never forcing himself on anyone, but always waiting. Never letting his arms drop down in despair, but always hoping that his children will return so that he can speak words of love to them and let his tired arms rest on their shoulders. His only desire is to bless. Church, that's a beautiful picture of God that I agree with. Why? Because God so loved the world, he sent his son. Not to condemn, but to save. Church, what we see in Jesus on the cross, right? A God who does not stop spreading his arms until the work of reconciling humanity to himself is done. Until the last breath says, it is finished. Behind every command of God, every ask of Jesus, every message of how we are to live our lives for God is that heart of limitless mercy and grace that just wants his children home. And so, church, we're kind of left with this question, and we're going to end our time here by asking this question. Do we live like that father? Do we understand that is our father? Do we live our lives and treat others that way? Does the way we live look like Jesus on the cross? Or does it so, look like some other God, some other understanding of who the Father is? Which God do you see and know? And do you live as Jesus, the true Son, who lives as the Father lives, the true Son who celebrates and parties whenever that child comes home? Jesus calls us to be like the Father, just as Jesus is like the Father, to love our neighbors, to love our friends, to love our enemies to those who mistreat us. Church, he calls us to love Democrats and Republicans. He calls us to love Black Lives Matter and the police. He calls us to love all children of God, no matter how far we may think they are away from home. And Jesus shows us, yes, we should even love the Pharisees among us. This one's the tough one for me. Because after all, Jesus tells these stories to the Pharisees so that they can see themselves in it and find God's heart. And church, as a community, we must always ask ourselves, do we as branch line sit in our church and wait for the lost to come to us? Or do we ask them to jump through the hurdles of life in order to join us at home with God? Or are we out there as a community showing and telling them about God's love for them, sharing with them our faith, bludgeoning them with God's grace and mercy? Again, working on the imagery. But... You get the idea. Are we reminding each other the real reason we're here, the central mission of Branchline, is to connect people to a growing relationship with Jesus, to the one who represents the Father, standing with arms open to any lost child. And church, that means that we go out as Jesus goes out to help people find home, to feel that love from the Father, to call them back to God, the only one who can satisfy. Church, that we might remove all obstacles from that path for them finding God and having their own homecoming. Let's pray.
Father, you displayed your heart with Jesus on the cross. We thank you for that gift. Not just the gift of eternal life, Lord, but the gift and gratitude of your love, your mercy, your grace. Lord, we're so thankful that you're a God who runs and seeks after us. That you're a God that clears the obstacles and removes our sin so that we can be at home with you. God, we thank you for that. And Lord, we pray that you would just instill that vision in our hearts. That your love would become the main motivation for our life that your limitless mercy would come out in our actions towards other people. Father, that we could be sons who celebrate with you when other people come home, that we could be out there searching as you search, calling people home. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful gift of who you are in your being. And we pray your heart would become our own. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.